Hi. Hi, everyone, in case you're joining in early. Uh, my name is Shobhit Gaur. I am the PMM at Great HR. Uh, we are just joining, we're starting the meeting a little bit early, starting the webinars a little bit early, giving a minute or two for people to join and trickle in. Uh, in the meanwhile, there's a, there's a chat option where you can just say where you're joining from. Uh, would love to know where all you're joining from across this country. We'll start the webinar in a minute, give people a minute to join in so people don't miss out on the exciting intros that we're going to do. Anybody joining right now, we are basically going to be talking about the impact of background verification. This webinar basically promises a lot, especially with background verification. And the entire session will basically uncover all the promises that BGV makes and can we, can we utilize all of them and make use of them in our lives. So I'm very, very excited for this webinar and I'll just start off and kick off the webinar. Hi everybody, thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, this webinar is purely for background verification. Uh, if you do background verification well, its impact is far reaching. It'll help you hire smartly. It'll also help you save more. Uh, tall promises, big promises, and we'll cover all of these promises in our webinar. I would love to introduce the speaker that we have here. Okay. Yes, sorry about that glitch. We have Anoop Suresh with us, who's the CEO of uh, Springworks. He has a rich 20 years of experience working across industries, across companies, across sectors, and starting his own companies as well. Right? Anoop, uh, thank you for joining in. If I could ask you, what kind of BGV have you actually seen for yourself when you used to work in all these different companies? <laughs> any any few, you know, new BGVs that you encountered, different BGV that you encountered in your professional life? So, I mean, what you're asking me now is so many decades in the past, but yeah, I mean, if I have to go back to what I remember it being, it, back then it just used to be like a 20 page form that people would have to fill up. So BGV would just essentially be like a one day activity as part of your onboarding, right? So people would have to do photocopies and they'd have to fill out these long forms manually. Yeah, a lot has changed in the last 15, 20 years. A lot has changed in the last five years. Right. So I I, I think I'm very, very excited to cover up all of those changes. And I wanted to introduce our second uh, speaker. Uh, our second speaker is Shashank. He is the PM at Great HR. He looks after Unite Marketplace and much more. Shashank, if you could give any specific, any any BGV that you got done for your career for the audience. Yeah, hey, everyone. Uh, so I can uh, give an example of the most recent one that's been done in Great HR. That is, uh, we went through ID5, right? Uh, so it was, a, I think, a two-month process on the whole where uh, we completed the BGV within two months. Even before, uh, just after offer acceptance, we started and extended even after uh, joining the company. Thank you, Shavad. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think time for just hygiene check for this webinar. What you can expect from the webinar. In case you have questions like me, you can put up your questions in the big Q&A button right here. And we'll pick up your questions uh, uh, and ask our uh, expert speakers. And we have divided this webinar in three sections. And uh, I think just before starting our webinar, uh, going deeper into those sections, I have a quick poll for all of you. Just give me one minute while I launch this poll. So the poll says, how do you do background verification? Uh, first option, I'm new to BGV, want to learn how to do it. Second option, I do BGV internally through our team. Third option is I use external companies for doing BGV. The reason why I'm asking for this particular question is I want to know from the audience where they are at in their BGV journey. 
so we can mold our content accordingly and we can give you more and more value since you have joined our webinar giving us your precious precious time in the meanwhile just my few thoughts on bgv uh, and i want to know more about it as well uh, initially when i started off i said bgv promises a lot and one of those promises is a better work culture uh, another promise is you get more savings if uh, you don't hire badly another promise is employees tend to stay longer right uh, there are so many promises that bgv impact of bgv is supposed to be very very big uh, personally i am going to ask anup a lot of questions around this particular topic as well trying to uncover how does that actually happen how do these great promises come to be so i'm ending the poll and we have got a like a even sort of a split uh, about equal number of people have said that they're new to bgv uh, equal number of people have said uh, they do it internally while a slightly higher number of people say they do it from external sources this is going to be an helpful information right and uh, i think uh, jumping straight into it uh, i've read quite a bit about bgv and some of these statistics are quite scary to be honest i read that more than 75% people lie on their resumes i was always on the other side i didn't imagine what the admins who go through this process you know deal with uh, another shocking metric for me was uh, a lot of people actually employees actually steal from their workplaces a number which i don't even want to share right because it's so stark and so mind blowing um i think with all all of this sort of a nervous scared energy uh, i want to pose a question for a new that you know why why do people do this and how does it happen please please help <laughs> well anyway firstly <laughs> thank you shubhit great hr team love doing this um i'm with springworks and the chief operating officer like shobit mentioned we are india's highest rated and most reviewed uh, background check platform so <clears throat> coming to your question shobit i think the first thing is uh, to sort of maybe put the stats aside i think a lot of companies as part of marketing tend to put out a lot of these stats uh, my personal experience with this is it's it's all very contextual so now for example you said there's this one big number this one big stat where people are talking about how employees are stealing from uh some of their employers it also you need that context in terms of who you're talking about right is it is it a gig worker is it somebody that is hired as say an engineer or somebody that is hired as uh in sales or is it somebody like let's say if it's a swiggy or a zomato right like a lot of this context goes missing in these stats <clears throat> my two cents on this is you always have to look at it from two perspectives right why why do companies do bgv in the first place either it's from a standpoint of prudence like like let's say for example if we had to hire somebody at home maid driver cook how do all of us go about hiring this sort of people you always do it on the basis of some reference that somebody has given you right you are never really just going out in the open and in the public and then just highest bidder wins or lowest bidder wins we never do that we're always looking at it through the lens of somebody else's experience and um, now within your own home uh, if something does go wrong the maximum liability is just with regards to you and your family but with an organization it's very different if something goes wrong first of all you're also looking at the safety of other employees uh, additionally you're also looking at the safety of your customers because um, you know there's to be this old adage data is the new oil today every company respect of what line of business you're in we're all data companies right and um, while employees can be our and are our biggest sort of asset small number of them if not hired correctly or if uh, don't have the right intentions can also be the biggest liability because data is the easiest thing to leak and right? so i think we have to sort of look at it from that lens more than the statistics more important to realize why we have to do it now companies generally do it for two reasons one is out of prudence or one is on the basis of compliance now i'm sure a lot of people are aware that india is moving towards you know the gdpr like data protection and data privacy laws we have this new law which as in it's it's an act at this point in time but at some point it will turn into a law it's called the digital uh, personal data protection act right so this is 
a lot of it is inspired by how GDPR itself works, right? So now one of the key things that any organization will want to do to ensure that they are compliant with this is probably get certifications like say an ISO 27001 or a 27001. Now these are essentially data security and data privacy frameworks, right? You'll have an external auditor that will come in and help you figure out all your processes. Because let's face it, all of us as organizations, when we first start, it's always with the best of intentions. We want to deliver great value to customers. But there's a lot of things we don't know. These are all things we have to learn on the job, right? How do you store data? What sort of encryption to use? Right? Multiple processes that have to be set up in place. If there is an incident, for example, right? Like how do you handle it? And so that's where these frameworks come into play. And now with laws like this coming into effect, a lot of companies have now... See, uh, whenever we have to sign on a new customer, uh, there is a process as part of all of these ISO compliances where you have to vet your vendor. You can't just bring on a new vendor to your organization. You have to send them an InfoSec questionnaire and companies want to know all sorts of things. Right? They want to know how you save your data, where you save your data, is your data encrypted? One of the key things that people ask in that is, do you run background checks on your employees? And if you do, what sort of checks? It? Because essentially companies are looking to try and figure out, because if two businesses are working together, uh, if I'm the vendor, let's say you're uh, the buyer of the services, essentially in some way, shape or form, I am interacting with some of your customer data. So if you've done everything on your end, due diligence wise, you expect the same out of me as well, because some of that data is flowing to us. And a big portion of that is ensuring that uh, employees are verified. Why are employees verified? It's a due diligence matter, right? You want to be prudent with this, just like how we're being prudent at home. It's the same thing here. So. Today, the way it works is either people do it out of prudence or it's a compliance requirement. It can either be because of one of these frameworks or you have genuinely a customer. Say, imagine if you're working with the Microsofts of the world or the Googles of the world, they will not onboard a vendor unless and until they have all these data privacy, data protection uh, frameworks in place. And the first thing that those frameworks ask for, if you're ISO 27001 certified or 27001 certified or SOC 2 certified, first thing they will ask for is, that you have run some form of due diligence on your employees. Now they don't specify, they, they will never tell you what you have to run. That's a risk that you have to assess. Right? They will expect you as the business to know. If I have to give you an example now, let's say if you're in the business of a Swiggy or a Zomato, you're not going to be able to run an education check or an employment check on some of those delivery folks, right? So if it's a skilled worker, you're looking at a different set of checks. If you're looking at somebody in the engineering space, it's a different set of checks. If you're looking at somebody that's for management, public facing, right? You may want to run a different set of checks. So from a stats standpoint, I know everybody's got all sorts of stats around these things. I think the way for all of us as businesses to approach it is just purely from a prudent standpoint. When do we start? How do we start? Those are all things that we can obviously discuss. Uh, I think uh, your response kind of makes me want to ask our audience, what do they actually think about with BGV, right? And how do they do BGV? So we prepared a poll for them. I'm just launching it for them. So I think it's now on their screen. Why should companies conduct background verification? Where the option one says that to ensure the accuracy of candidate resumes. Option two says to maintain a safe and secure work environment. Option three says to protect the company's reputation and avoid penalty. While option four says to enhance the qualities of hire by verifying candidates. To all the people in the audience right now watching this event, I would love to know what they think is the correct choice. And uh, just a little secret, there's no one correct answer, right? There are basically a, more than a few correct answers. I think uh, seeing a lot of participation in the poll, uh, the highest sort of, uh, choice has been to enhance the quality of hires by verifying the candidate's qualification and experience. And that is closely followed by to maintain a safe and secure working environment by screening for criminal records. So two very different uh, points. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think in the initial part of the webinar, I brought this up, right? Promises that BGV offers. And it seems that people are seeing the results of those promises. They also buy into those promises as well, right? 
I think uh, it's time for me to end the poll. Uh, and uh, like I said, those were the two major uh, responses. The other two responses were also correct and people participated in it. Anup, um, I think uh, I was thinking from a place of misconceptions and myths about BGV, right? Uh, there is so much information out there. And I was thinking maybe we could take some time right now and just clear up certain major myths people keep you know, thinking wrong about. So one of those things was you can't be hired a candidate can't be hired if their BGV fails. Uh, what, what do you think about this? Um, yes, absolutely a major misconception. Simply because, so uh, let's put it like this. You've run a background check on somebody. Something's come off, right? Now, it could be something to do with employment, could have something to do with education, could have something to do with criminal records. Now, as a BGV company, the job is essentially to be an unbiased, independent sort of data reviewer, right? So you send us as a candidate, you're going to send us a bunch of information. We are have to going to go out into the market, check to see against all of those sources if the data matches up or not. Now, irrespective of whether the data matches up or not, um, that report eventually comes back to you as is, right? There's, there's nothing that we, we can't imbue it with any sense of an opinion, right? So now that data is supposed to come back to you as it is. Question becomes, if it's a green, obviously everybody knows, right? We're not even going to look at it. It's, it's all good. There's no problem. But if it's a red, what do you do? And that's where I think a lot of companies, especially somebody that's just starting up in their journey, it's a small company, 50 people, 100 people, um, somebody that the HR team is relatively on the younger side, not essentially knowing what to do when something is red. People's assumption is always, if a background check report is red, it essentially means we have to terminate this person. But that can technically be extremely insensitive not just to the employee itself or rather this candidate, but also from a standpoint of what happens to all those man hours and effort that have gone into interviewing this person and bringing them on board, right? So it's never, that's not really the case. Any background check report that is sent to a company, irrespective of what it says, if it's read especially, first thing you want to do is get a sense of why it's read. And you know, there could be multiple reasons why a background check report is read. But the first thing you want to do is actually sit down with that individual and have a chat with them to get a sense of clarity. I'll give you a couple of examples. We've had we've seen multiple scenarios where the employment records come back as a red. Why did it come back as a red? The start date and the end date don't match what the employer is saying. Right? The start date says January as per the candidate, end date says December as per the candidate, but the previous employer says this person only started with us in June. And you can't always assume that the candidate is wrong. There's always a sense that there could also be a challenge with the records. And we've seen so many cases where the source issued that document. It's an authentic document. When we went back to the source, they had a different set of data. So that disparity in data can always occur. It's important to get both sides of the story. Right? So then the candidate, you can always talk to the candidate and say, this is what your previous employer has said. Can you please go back, check with them? You can open up an email thread directly with us, keep the BGV company in tow as well in CC. And then people will always, and I've personally been involved in so many cases where, you know, I've had to reach out to the heads of HR at other companies, get them to help. And so that's sort of what you want your BGV company to assist with as well. Right? Um, there can also be situations where in your criminal records, um, maybe you were a petitioner in a particular court case, right? Now, a lot of uh, a lot of people in the industry, they have a very sort of, um, how do I put this, a very, very monotonous way of grading things. As long as they find some sort of a criminal record against your name, irrespective of whether you're a petitioner or irrespective of whether you're a respondent. A petitioner is somebody that is filing the charge. A respondent is somebody that is responding to it. So now, the case could be going on in court. Until there is a judgment, you don't know for a fact whether you can act on this information or how this impacts you, right? I could sue you for anything, right? You, you, I could just walk into the court right now and, and file a suit against you. There is no law that prevents us from filing suits against people. So that alone, now, of course, that will come back in the BGB report as a red. Why does it come back as a red? Because in that ocean of green that comes to customers, this one red is how they we let them know that something is off. Right? Now, when you review that, you get that context. So it's purely context driven, right? There are sometimes issues where let's say this person's education is a little off, right? Maybe I've seen multiple situations where the university itself was not legit. So the university exists, right? They are just not allowed to run a specific course. So let's say you studied engineering in a specific uh, university, 
for no fault of your own, right? Like they portrayed it to you to be a genuine university. You went ahead, you finished your four years there. Now you graduated. And then the UGC comes out a couple of years later and says, you know, this university was never allowed or was never supposed to be issuing this degree. How can you take that away from a candidate, right? So that also will come up as a red report, but that does not mean termination. That's a that's something to sit down and have a chat with the candidate about. Nine out of 10 times, you will find that candidates have something to tell you or some value to provide to you in terms of what exactly happened. So it's, it's never as black and white as that. Understood. I think uh, uh, just going through that uh, answer, it, it does take me away from the zone of doubt, zone of sus suspicion, right? And it wants me to, you know, get to know more about BGV, given the fact that BGV is not black and white. There's so much color of gray and everything that we are accommodating, uh, especially with that uh, court case example. I think uh, uh, I have personally seen people struggle with this. And uh, I right now want to know more about BGV for, for people who have bought into the idea of BGV, right? Uh, we were talking about court cases, we were talking about educational degrees. Uh, my limited understanding for BGB says that there are a lot of plans out there when people choose to do BGB. If you could shed some light on that, especially with, you know, examples of the company sizes that you were talking about and when would be like a good time to do these uh, checks. So that would be, you know, really, really helpful for me and the audience. So um, when is the right time to actually start a background check? If you ask me, and if you're trying to err on the side of prudence, right? You you want to always be cautious. Makes sense. If you're the founder, the first person that you hire, you start background checks. But is it practical? Obviously not, right? So this is, again, a, a decision that companies generally you know have to make for themselves. Uh, we find a lot of companies, uh, this, is a, this is a new thing that we've started seeing. In the old days, we wouldn't see companies under 100 or under, say, 50, start running background checks. Uh, why would they do it? Most of the time, they would simply do it, even though these are all people that they've hired out of their own network, the only reason that they would do it is because it was a client task. Client specifically said, we will only work with you if you are ISO 27001 certified or if you are ISO 27001 certified, right? Your data privacy and data security are paramount when you're working with large organizations. So first thing when they ask them for that, as a result of getting these certifications, they had to get BGB done, right? But then having said, but again, there are enough number of companies out there that don't necessarily work with organizations that request it. But over the last couple of months, ever since DPDPA became more prevalent, we are starting to suddenly see a massive uptick in the number of smaller companies, right? Very young companies have just started five people, 10 people, but it's sort of become like a mandate internally for them because of the clients that they work with. So earlier where only large enterprises would ask for this. Today, you're starting to see mid-market companies, SMBs also. Now, for example, we're a 200-person company. We will not onboard anybody unless and until uh, that vendor themselves, you know, sort of has uh, ISO 27001 or any of these compliances in place. Now, if they have to have that, they have to have employee background checks done. So now the question becomes, what checks do you run, right? Which is something you were talking to me about earlier as well. How does the company decide what makes sense for them? Again, purely up to you. You have to figure out what risk is involved. But what I can suggest is based on sort of an industry understanding of what makes the most sense. Typically, and again, that's also contextual. Now, mostly in the business, we call it a five-point check. There's identity, there's criminal, there's address, there's last employment, and then there's education, right? But does that make sense for somebody that is being hired as a Swiggy or a Zomato rider? or anybody in the, you know, sort of skilled worker space, obviously not, right? So you decide based on the type of hirings that you have, what checks make the most sense. Now, if you're looking at, say, Swiggy, Zomato, any of those sort of use cases, blue collar folks, right? You're, generally, your only options are ID, address, and court, right? Now, is it possible that an auditor who is running your infosec for you will come and ask you later, why aren't you running more checks? Why aren't you running employment? Why aren't you running education? 100% possible, but you've done everything that you possibly can in this case to ensure due diligence. Is that Swiggy Rider going to have formal education? Are they going to possibly have, say, some sort of a formal professional uh, job in the past? Unlikely, right? So in that context, you've done everything you possibly can as a business. You've run an identity check to make sure that you know exactly who's coming on board. You've done a criminal verification, which is very, very important. 
and you've also run an address verification, both at their permanent and at their current address, given the fact that they're constantly in touch with your customers, right? In the early days when e-commerce first started, uh, all the large players, none of them right at the start were running any form of background checks. It's not required by law. The Indian government or no sort of uh, body will ever ask you to run it. Right? So they didn't. But then what happened? You started to hear all these horror stories, right? Some really heinous crimes happened. There were a couple of, I, 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 I'm I, fairly certain I remember that there was at least one murder in there somewhere. So when these sort of things started happening, that's when things go haywire. Until everything is fine, nobody's asking questions. But the minute something like this happens, even law enforcement will ask you that question. Didn't you, didn't you all run? Like, what data do you have about this person? How did you just hire this person without anything? So at that point, most companies will say, no, we collected all this documentation. But then when you check, a lot of the times the people that have caused problems will have provided you fake documentation. As the HR team, I mean, how much am I going to do as the HR team? I'm responsible for HR, especially at a young company. I'm responsible for talent acquisition. I'm responsible for HRBP, HR ops. There's only so much that anybody in HR can do. At best, we can run reference checks. At best, we can pick up the phone and call the previous organization. Can we reach out to the university? No, it's very hard. How are you going to find criminal records? How are you going to verify somebody's Aadhaar or their PAN? Right? These all become increasingly more difficult. How are you going to verify somebody's address? That's where BGB starts to make a lot more sense. Now, with regards to the checks that you were asking, so if it's somebody in the skilled worker space, these are the checks that make sense. If you slowly start moving towards sort of you know desk jobs, right? you're hiring somebody for sales, you're hiring somebody as an engineer, there you want to maybe expand the portfolio a little bit. right? You go from the standard ID, address, criminal, you expand it now to employment. Now again, why are you doing employment? Is it just for the sake of doing it? No. You're hiring this person for a very specific reason. You want to understand a large part of why you decided to hire this person is also because of where they came from. If I told you I'm working at, say, Infosys, part of the reason you're hiring me is because of that. But what if I didn't? Right. So that's another thing that you'd want to you know, check out. A reference check makes a lot of sense, right? You want to get a sense from the previous sorry, from the previous reporting manager as to how I did. Not from the perspective of asking that previous reporting manager only questions like sort of gotcha questions, right? Can you tell me everything that's wrong about Anu? That's not necessarily the best way to go about it. What you want to get a sense from my previous reporting manager is what makes Anu tick? How, how does he work, right? What's the best way to get him, you know, to deliver the best work for us? What are some of the key things that he likes doing? How does he work, right? Is he somebody that is more task-oriented? Is he somebody that likes to just be given a problem statement and go from there, right? So these are the types of things that you want to get into as you start moving up the line. Uh, education, again, personally, I've always asked all my clients not to run education simply because the large companies of the world today, your Googles, Microsoft, none of them, they've all sort of walked away from that. Why? Simply because you're hiring people on the basis of the skill set that they provide. Now, when I interview you for a, uh, for a job, for example, it's a fairly extensive interview, right? There are tests, there's all sorts of things. So I already figured out, you know, fitment on the basis of that. Now what's left? The only thing I need to figure out is how did you play well? Did you play well or not with the previous organization that you were working with? If that's done, you're good to go. Why go through this extensive, elaborate process of, you know, checking education? But let's say if it's a doctor, you're hiring a doctor, you're hiring a nurse. I can't say that, right? Just because you worked at another hospital, that's not enough reason for me to bring you on board. It suddenly then becomes relevant. Education is very relevant there. So these are things that companies have to figure out, right? In terms of what they do, uh, you know, you can always talk to your BGD provider, ask them these questions, right? Don't let people just sell you anything and everything as part of a package. Always check to see if it's genuinely relevant for you. Now, on the flip side, let's say you go more in terms of senior leadership. Senior leadership, you want to be a little more cautious. The, the, the sense there is not to get fewer checks. The sense there is to get a lot more checks. You want to maybe say, run a credit check on somebody that you're hiring as a director. Why? Because this person is somebody that's public facing. If something goes wrong, if there's any evidence of financial fraud or anything like that, that becomes a challenge for you to know. Right? You want to run a directorship check to see if this person is a director in any other company while they're supposed to be an exclusive director here. What about a social media scan? Doesn't matter so much for, say, an engineer or maybe somebody in sales, it might make sense. Maybe somebody that's customer facing, like customer success, customer support, you may want to do that. But if it's somebody in leadership, for sure you want to do it, right? You want to get a sense of what their leanings are. 
is there any evidence of hate speech is there any evidence of sort of riling up because these are people that you are hiring essentially to represent they are, they become the face of your organization right uh, a lot of companies look at drug tests right they want to get a sense like especially if you're in the medical business right like if you're in the uh, in the business where you're saving lives hospitals pharmacies you want to run that right because you don't want your doctor to also be imbibing in certain drugs that are going to cause challenges when they're trying to operate on right so there's a whole plethora of checks but i would say by and large for most of us it's either id address and quote or it will be id address quote employment and education you can more or less stick with this then of course depending on positions depending on the line of work that you're in right you pick and choose the checks that make more sense it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, i think i was just thinking about uh, your your point on education check and how much sense it really makes uh, really depending on the context of the employer for a big set of employer employment check does not make sense anymore while if i'm running a hospital or maybe i'm running a law firm or any very super specialized skill set it absolutely makes sense so my sort of a take away from this particular section is uh depending on the context of the company that you run the kind of business that you run and then also on the size of the company that you run the background checks that you're doing can range from let's say the top 5 that anup mentioned that usually that companies do and if you're going up and up and up the ladder i think uh, these different uh, background checks even including social media right if people are inciting uh, people are spreading misinformation and even the credit history a person who you are hiring on a leadership role if their credit history is bad i think i was just reading a report uh, today for swiggy that somebody you know did a massive sort of a, a mismanagement of funds uh, at a at a higher level and they they really suffered because of it and maybe you know uh, this particular bgv could have helped swiggy not to hire this person if you know they know this or maybe for the next company this information is very very crucial they would not hire this person yeah like and, the credit yeah. check that we're talking about it's a staple if you're in the banking business or the financial business right um as far as i know pretty much every bank runs a credit check on everybody that they hire within the bank right because you are essentially putting this person in charge of your customers money right so now if there is poor fiscal if there is evidence of poor fiscal behavior that's something you want to be aware of and so it's very contextual yeah that makes a makes a lot of sense uh, i think uh, knowing this i was thinking about there are so many checks and there's so much contextual information uh, uh i think this is one of those fields where information is quite a lot right so first i wanted to understand from our audience so when they let's say look for a for a bgv what kind of things are they looking in their bgv part what kind of things are they prioritizing so i have a poll for them i'm just launching it shortly it should be up on your screen the question is what factors are most important for you when choosing a background verification provider is it cost how much does it cost to do bgv is it speed how quick is the turnaround time accuracy we can't argue with this at all now we are coming to customer support uh, talking of large companies we are dealing in multiples how good is the customer support for this provider and the reputation of the bgv provider itself we have been talking about reputation of individuals of companies right does reputation come into play when you are choosing a bgv provider or you already have a bgv provider and this is the one major factor for you i think one thing that i want to share with our panelists uh, which will not surprise them is accuracy is by by far the highest sort of a choice it is that factor that people really 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 look for in our audience when they're choosing uh, you know bgv partner and both speed and customer support are kind of neck and neck uh i am um, i've been hearing of bgv checks that go on for a month 
and more while some bgv checks i have just recently heard that they are done instantaneously so i think that's where it kind of comes in and customer support for anybody working in in companies using software products i think it's a it's a it's something that people don't talk about enough but it's such a important thing especially when you run into problems kind of problems that anup was talking about earlier red flag how do you deal with it can't really get that person away right it does not mean that you will not hire that person talk to your bgv partner all right so i think uh, just ending this poll with 93% of the respondents saying accuracy is you know what they are looking for as the top most reason when they are choosing a background verification provider right uh, now this brings me up to my next point that i want to learn from anup is uh, how do i choose a a a good background verification provider there's so many in the market and uh, i know what i'm looking for accuracy and there's much more it's not only one thing i'm looking for much more uh, are there you know from your experience rules to go about doing this best practices best practices or anything that can help me and my audience choose a good bgv provider uh, for us sure so let's start based on the responses that we got from the poll itself everybody voted accuracy to be the number one thing how do you get accuracy any process that involves too much of repetitive human involvement generally has low accuracy bgv is an industry has for the longest time that's why i said right like a lot has changed in the last 5 years let alone the last 10 20 years a big part of what's changed in the industry today is we've all gotten to a degree of significant automation to the point where we don't need to ask manual sort of operational teams to do a lot of the mundane work in the old days in fact <laughs> i couldn't even say in the old days even now you like, let's take the example of say an employment verification how do you think it gets done you're supposed to reach out to the hr uh, team at the previous organization right so let's say you worked with uh, company x now what are we going to do as the minute you joined great hr we're going to initiate that bgv to the previous organization a lot of companies the way they do this is they send out an email first and they'll send out an email to hr at x.com and say can you please you know give us details about shobit now how does now it's, this is a pro bono activity you must always remember that right? nobody is getting paid for this right so the other company purely out of the goodness of their heart just to want to sort of reciprocate their response but are they going to make this a p0 activity no right they've got a million other things going on this is just one thing that's coming when they have the time they'll respond so now let's assume they didn't respond the next day what does the bgv company do or the person that's working on this case do they're going to you know go to a sheet an excel sheet where they have a list of templates copy that paste it in an email body again send it across again if they don't get a response there they'll do the same thing on the third day so they're keeping track right the problem with this is it's it's it's, it's a bit for them they're going to be doing this on a manual everyday basis where you're keeping track of which email you sent when you sent it when you have to send the next one you are bound to make mistakes and that's the reason why accuracy becomes a challenge because if you think about it i don't know we all learned this in school right lhs equals rhs essentially that's what it is. lhs is the candidate candidate gives us a bunch of information all we're supposed to go and do is go to the source and get their version of it compare the two together if both match it's good to go the only thing that we have to make sure is that between those two comparisons we don't make a mistake in representing the data from either end how do you do that the more and more human involvement in repetitive tasks human beings are not good with doing repetitive things it gets boring for us our brains are designed for more cooler things than that so how do you do that you, you bring in a lot more automation so like in our case one of the first things that we did i think what we've been around since 2018 2019 first things that we did was like yeah this is a huge waste of time right asking somebody to copy paste this mail format and send it every day we built a drip sequencing tool so how did for anybody that doesn't know this in sales um, let's say if i send you an email uh, from the sales team right um, you don't respond the sales person is not actually sending you the second mail or the third mail or the fourth mail following up you have a drip sequencing tool it will detect that you've not responded and then if you've not responded you've already set a cadence and you said okay if somebody doesn't reply within 2 days send them this second draft if they don't respond after that give them another 5 days still no response send them the third draft 
right? So sales teams have been using this for years. We built the same thing in the system. So now our teams don't have to do any manual work. Where's the next place where you can sort of improve accuracy? The response that comes back in, if you're expecting a person to read that response and go back and then type it into the system again, that's another area where you could make a mistake. I could very, half the time, I can't tell whether it's 2023 or 2024. Now I know the turn of the year is going to come. It's going to become 25. For the first six months, I'm going to be struggling with figuring out whether I'm writing 24 or 25. Right? So people will make this mistake. What do you do? You throw in some artificial intelligence, right? If your email is read by AI, which it can, and those are some of the things that we implement personally. It can essentially just take all of that data and put it back into the system and your report is ready. So you don't have that delay that happens as a result of somebody manually picking data from an email, copying it, pasting it. None of that happens. So that's how you get your accuracy up. Right? Now imagine if you're able to do this across checks. We talked about the identity check. How do we run our identity checks? We got an API that goes directly with NSDL. Right? So you put in data here, candidates putting the data in. By the time the candidates completed the form, it's already finished. You were asking about instant checks, right? Same thing with criminal records. How does it work? Whatever data is provided, the person's name. Because see, in India, the thing is, we don't have the concept of a social security number like how we have in the US. We have Aadhaar, which was intended to do that. But unfortunately, it's not involved or it's not set up everywhere. If let's say I have to file a complaint with you at the police station, I don't know your Aadhaar number. If let's say you get arrested and they bring you in, it's not a mandatory thing for them to get your Aadhaar number and type that in. So a lot of our records are based on somebody's name, somebody's father's name, somebody's date of birth, right? So how do we search these records? We use AI again then, right? AI is trying to, like take my name, for example, it's an ANOOP. If there is a court case against me for some reason, there's a high possibility that because the clerk there is typing this in manually, they could have put in my name as ANUP. AI needs to be smarter than just being able to do a standard name match saying, oh, you know, the record here is A and UP, so it's not this guy. It can't do that. That's where AI comes in, right? It gets a lot more smarter. Same thing with your address verification. We do something that is known as a digital address verification. You are providing me a textual address, right? You say, this is my passport. It's got my address in it. What does our system do? Detects that, figures out where on Google you actually live. Now, what happens is you run the digital address verification process. What does that process look like? In the old days, an agent would come over to your house, right? Now, the problem with the agent coming over is that it has to be a scheduled activity. First is I have to call you, check with you what time you're available. Next, my agent comes in. Now, hopefully, with all the traffic that happens in all the big cities, he may reach at that exact time. What's the chance that you may be in a meeting at that point or you may have forgotten about it and you left? And it's very high, right, that possibility. This is not like a flip card or an Amazon package when you ordered a phone or a TV that you're excited to receive. You will wait three days if required. You will wait at home just to make sure that you get that parcel. BGV is not the same. As a candidate, you don't care too much for it. It's just another process, right? So now that agent has shown up to your doorstep and you're not there. Or worst case, maybe the agent is not able to find the location. So the digital address, you get to play the role of the agent. Right? What does the agent do? Comes home, takes a couple of pictures. Every single one of those is uh, GPS tagged. Now, you can do the same thing on your phone. It takes less than five minutes. You get a link, take a picture. It, it asks you a couple of mandatory things that you have to take pictures of. Take that. It's all GPS tag. System checks to see if both the GPS tags, the one that came from the address, the textual address versus what's coming from your phone, both of them match, good to go. It's automatically sort of uh, graded it and moved forward. Right. So this is how automation brings your accuracy up. The next question that most people will have, the second one that you mentioned was speed. How do you get your speed? Um, see, the unfortunate reality of this business is there are instances where, like you said, things can go on for 30 days. Why? Let's take education. That's, that's the hot burner issue for me always, right? Uh, we have about 1,800 odd universities in India. Not all universities are alike, right? Now, most of them have a policy where they will only respond to you after 30 days. So officially, if they're only reach responding to you after 30 days, how is it possible for the background check company to deliver it much faster? Background check industry has created a couple of hacks, right? We've figured out ways of sending people directly there, talking to somebody else, maybe not an official source, but somehow we'll get that. Way. But there is always that edge case that can happen. Let's assume it's a small company. You are working at a small startup, single person founder, nobody else there, probably on the verge of winding down. What are the chances that when we reach out to that person, that person is going to provide first priority to this email? 
if it's a big company, like let's say if it's an Infosys or a PTM or a TCS, they have a set process. They have a team that does only this, respond to these uh, requests. But if it's a smaller company, how can you guarantee? But having said that, from the customer standpoint, you don't want to be waiting 30 days or 60 days to onboard somebody. Some of the ways to do this is you split your BGV. We call, we refer to it as tiered BGV. Would you mind if I shared a screen to help people understand this a little better? Yeah, yeah. In the meanwhile, while Anup shares the screen, uh, I think two things that I'm getting is basically automation to ensure accuracy. And for speed, I think uh, Anup is just I think, mentioning all of the things right now. Over to Anup. Yes. So I'll, I'll give you a quick understanding of how this works. So we've now moved into the era where we break down checks, right? We don't treat BGV as one big package and everything has to get done for the person to get on board. We sort of smart onboard people. So how do you run a tiered BGV? Now, we've slowly, over the last couple of years, we've started seeing how companies have changed the way that they do this. In the old days, it used to be you'd only run a background check on somebody at the point when they're ready to start. So if I'm joining the organization today, my background check starts today. That, over the last few years, has changed to now. Post-offer acceptance. As the candidate, if I've accepted the offer, at that point, people start the BGV. Why? Because they save a lot of time. This candidate is going to take 15 days to 30 days or maybe two months to join the organization. Can I get the background check done before this person shows up at my doorstep? Right? Uh, now we are seeing that people are trying to move into the uh, into the space of pre-offer BGV itself. Why? Because why waste time? Why go through the offer process if I can figure out a couple of things? But the overall sense is, oh, background checks take time, right? At the point when I'm trying to make an offer, if I have to sit and run a background check that's going to take me 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, no TA, nobody in talent acquisition is going to be happy about it. So how do you actually do this? So I don't know if this is clear to everybody. I will maybe zoom in a little bit. Yeah, much clearer now. Right? So if you look at the checks on the left, right? these are what we refer to as the pre-offer checks. They're digital and they're instant. You're, you can run a resume review. You can run a gap check. What is a resume review? I check to see. So this is another thing that you will very commonly see. Uh, candidates will give the interviewer a resume that maybe they fibbed a little bit and sort of elaborated on a couple of things like, you know, that may not necessarily be true. Now what happens is at the point when they've hired and then now we start running the background check, the data that they provide us at that point of time will be pitch perfect. They won't be any modifications to it in any way. Because they're very well aware that when the background check report comes back green, HR folks or HR teams are not generally going to look at it. But the truth is, what you claimed in the interview is a little different than what I'm actually seeing on the ground. So we do this thing called a resume. We check to see what, we're not taking the resume from the candidate. We take the resume from the HR or the person that interviewed this person, right? And then you compare it with what information this person provided during the background check process. Excellent way to be able to figure out if there are any discrepancies, right? So this is again, fully AI driven. There are, in case there are edge cases, obviously it goes to a manual team, but those with each passing day as our AI models keep getting better, keeps reducing, right? So we're aiming to get to a point where 90, 95% of these things are handled entirely by AI itself, right? So you can run a resume review, a gap check. You can do an identity and face match. So your ID check, face match to see. Uh, during COVID, people had this problem a lot. The person that was interviewing is different from the person that joined the organization. Right? So how do you figure these things out? You can run a face match. Right? So during the interview process itself, all you need is a picture of this person. You can probably, at some point, we'll probably have plugins that can you know go into things like a Google Meet or a Zoom, where it'll pull up that person's picture. And then we can check to see at the point when we start the background check if it's actually the same person or not. So your criminal and civil records, again, fully digital, unless there's a problem. If we find too many records, and like I said, in India, the records are not very clean. There is always this potential or this possibility that things can go a little off. So in those cases, you want to be able to have a manual team with it. But long story short, all these checks that I've highlighted here are all instant. So you can do nine of these checks almost immediately and what you need for it is just this much you need a person's resume you need a person's pan card or just their pan number or other number you need a proof of address 
an email address with of their current employer, their social media handles if you choose to run social media checks, and a selfie. With just these very simple, easy to find pieces of information on your phone, you can get so many things done. You can check their addresses, you can check their credit scores, you can check their current employment. This is another common challenge. Right? The person has not exited the organization yet. So you can't reach out. If I reach out to the HR team of uh, a candidate that you're hiring while they're still working there, it becomes a problem. Company will always say, we, we are not in the business of you know talking to you about somebody that's active and that's an active employer. There's also a chance that you may have not told your previous employer why you are leaving. Right? So that's another challenge. So we can check all of these things without impacting the candidate. There's also moonlighting. There's a salary confirmation. You can check to see if somebody's salary is actually what they've claimed it to be. So all of this can get done. Amazing. So just to round up for, for all the audience members, we know that automation helps with accuracy. Search for companies, how they go about with automation in order to ensure that your BGV service is accurate. Uh, the second thing is about speed. Now we know that uh, BGV is done pre-offer as well with very limited information, which usually a candidate provides in the first go itself. You could be doing a lot of BGV in the background instantaneously through the help of technology. And it helps cut down on a lot of time that gets wasted or gets spent. Right. So those are the two major things. And I think for customer support to check out for the reviews of the, of the company on the website, on the internet, these review websites like G2, you will get a fairer picture when you are looking for your new BGP provider. Right. So I think uh, after this particular point, I want to introduce a, a new thing that great HR is doing. Right. So we have built a marketplace inside Great HR and uh, it's called Unite Marketplace. And Shashang is here to talk about the marketplace and how there is a BGV app provider right here in the comfort of Great HR. Over to you, Shashang. Thank you, Shobit. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope my uh, screen is visible. It is. Yeah, thank you. So uh, just like uh, Shobit mentioned just now, uh, that Great HR has introduced a Unite Marketplace where uh, it's an ecosystem of applications that we have, which is directly integrated into uh, the Great HR uh, workflow uh, to make HR's life easier, right? In that, uh, you can find Spring Verify uh, is also an application that is directly integrated with uh, uh, the Great HR ecosystem currently. Uh, you, you can find Spring Verify in the marketplace and you can click uh, view details there. On clicking view details on that particular app widget, app widget you will be redirected to the application page uh, where you will be able to find all the details and whatever is required by you to make a decision to go forward with the application. You will find it here. Like as you can see the tabs here, overview tab about integration, pricing, and also you'll have a demo there. So basically it will answer your uh, what what is Spring Verify and why is Spring Verify required and uh, uh, how can you proceed further so that you can have this experience within GritHR, right? So as you can see here, there are two parts that you can take. Uh, one is if you want more and more information about uh, this particular application before uh, making the decision, you can contact the application directly uh, by, by uh, giving your reason and you can select a slot and you'll be directly connected with the vendor and the representative will take you through the entire process and demo the product as well, right? Other part is you can directly enable it where you can just uh, need to give a few details on uh, uh, basic details about your company and some permissions required uh, for the automation in place. Uh, after few uh, checks and there will be a call uh, or the meeting between Spring Verify and the customer, uh, after that, uh, the uh, the application will be enabled within Greater for you. And this is the dashboard, right? This is how easy it is for you to enable Spring Verify and start using it. And you can initiate a BGV uh, within 24 hours. That's how simple it is to uh, use uh, Spring Verify application on Unite uh, Marketplace now. So if you have any further questions, we can uh, definitely connect on and we will we can give a demo further to you. And thank you. Over to you, Shobit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sashan. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, I want to ask the audience members, 
uh, a specific question. Uh, given that you know about, you know, how to go about doing BGV checks, how to choose a specific vendor, all the complications and all the information that came about to you, and you can do it very, very easily through Great HR itself. Would you like some help doing BGV? Can, can we help you do BGV more efficiently? That's my question to you. You might have seen a poll appearing on your screen. And there are very simple answers, yes or no. If you select yes, we would reach out to you, uh, understand the context that you have, right? Help you uh, do it more efficiently, do it in a way that helps your company. Uh, and if you select no, uh, we would respect your decision. And, uh, you know, we hope that you have gotten some value from the event itself. Just gonna let the poll be there for a little bit more time. Uh, Rubid, I think we have a few questions. Yes, yes. I think one of the questions you have started answering already, right? I think it's from Hiral. Uh, how can you check moonlighting digitally? Okay, um, two very simple ways. Um, one is you run this through the PF system, right? So let's say if the previous company is a Provident Fund subscriber, and if this individual has received um, any sort of transactions through their Provident Fund, that is something that you can easily check, right? You'll be able to identify if this person has uh, records across more than one organization at the same point in time. Uh, having said that, PF records, not always very, very clear. Right, because PF records generally have what? They have the name of the person, they have the organization, they won't have a designation. They will have a start date and an end date in terms of when the PF itself was filed. Uh, but you will find that there is a reasonable number of people for whom even after they've exited the organization, for some reason, it's not updated. It could be a challenge with the organization updating it, or it could be a challenge with the system itself for some reason. Of course, people there is a recourse. People can apply. They can figure these things out. But that is still a great way to be able to figure out if there is any uh, moonlighting per se. Additionally, you can also look at Form 26 years. Um, the assumption would be that if I'm working as an employee somewhere, definitely there's going to be some sort of a deduction in terms of uh, the money that is being paid out to me as part of my salary. If I'm working as a consultant, right, not on the books, just as an external person, every organization will typically deduct a TDS. Unless, of course, the payout itself is very, very small, which is generally not the case, right? So Form 26S is, again, a brilliant way to be able to figure out if the person is receiving funds from two separate places at the same point in time. Uh, and also, what is the nature of the activity? So now, whenever a TDS is deducted, Government of India has, uh, or at least the financial departments, they have a code. They have like a 192A or 192J. So based on that, you'll be able to identify whether this is a salary or whether this is uh, as part of a consulting fee that is being paid. So that's how you're able to figure this out digitally. Understood, Anu. Uh, I'm taking up another question. This is for Shashank, right? Uh, Shashank, I think Hiral is asking about uh, how do you how do you get this feature? I think you were talking about uh, Swingorify in grade HR. If you could share some simple steps with Hiro? Yeah, so uh, for all the admin accounts, so for example, uh, you're a great customer currently and in your HR admin dashboard, you have a Unite icon enabled to your left of your navigation panel. menu. It'll be towards the end of it, right? Uh, like I showcased, you on clicking it, you can just directly enable uh, access the Unite marketplace. You can just follow the steps on screen, right? Understood. I've already answered in the question also. Thank you. Understood. Understood. Uh, I think uh, this one is for Anu. Uh, the question is uh, from Chitra. What should we do at the case of no response from previous employer? How can we close the case? Um, easy, right? So number one, uh, see, it, you may not always be able to you know, get a green or a red. But see, at the end of the day, that's what you hire a BGV company for. The hope is that you get either a green case or a red case. It's unfortunate that sometimes it's just impossible to reach these organizations. Unless it's a very small organization, I think you have some alternatives. Number one, UAN is available. Right? I'm assuming that for most of us, when we hire people where we are verifying their previous employment, chances are fairly high that they work with an organization that at least has PF. Right? Second is, I was again telling you earlier, the same thing that we can use to verify 
moonlighting is the same thing that you can use with uh, you know for this as well form 26as works very well if i have received a salary from some organization from x period to y period yes you will not be able to tell what this person's designation was i could have come to you and claimed that i worked in sales for all you know i could have been working in support right that part obviously is hard to figure out but at least we can get a sense of if this person was working with that organization or not so that's one way to be able to obviously as a company we'll have to reduce our standards a little bit in the sense that normally we like to verify name company name designation start date end date in this case we might have to compromise on the designation we also have to compromise on the dates a little bit it may not be the specific date for example if i joined on the 5th of jan exited on the 12th of december you won't know that based on the form 26a but you will have a ballpark number which is generally better compared to getting just say an un unable to verify understood uh, so we have a lot of questions but we are running out of time uh, to all those questions i just want to share that you can write up your questions uh, and share with me i'm just sharing my email id on the screen just one second and we will basically follow up with answers to you on on your email if you can see my screen right now um, basically shobit at the rate greater.com some of you have asked these question on q and a we get the email address so in case your question was not answered we will follow up with the answers to those questions in case you asked a question anonymously i would just request one thing if you could please forward your question to shobit at the rate greater.com we could basically you know reach out to you and provide an answer to you i think that's been our time uh, i am uh, amazed at the amount of questions we got really engaging uh, amount of responses to our polls and all the learning that we had from our session thank you so much anup it's been very engaging very educative uh, in in an hour i'm really getting out from this session uh, quite a lot of things for bgb for the rest of my career and shashank thank you so much uh, it's quite easy from what i can see to quickly do uh, bgb right from the comfort of uh, great hr thank you everybody who's joined the event thank you for giving us time i hope we gave a lot of value to you and uh, just in case of any questions uh, uh, you can reach out to me shobhit at the rate greater.com thank you anup thank you shashank Thank you. That's and if anybody has any BGB specific questions, like I see a lot of the questions are around how do we do X, Y. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. I'm available on LinkedIn. You can just search for me, Anup Suresh. Spring Works or Spring Verify. You should be able to find me. Happy to answer any of these questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you for the generous offer, Anup. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a lovely Friday, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.